Hey church, well today is the last sermon in our But Why series, a series where we've been looking at the reasons why Jesus had to die, and die specifically in the way that he did. Uh, for the last week, uh, last few weeks, we've looked at some of the consequences of the death of Jesus in our lives. So, so how the death of Jesus has these sort of ripple effects uh, that ripple out into the context of our everyday lives. Today, we're going to look at how the death of Jesus now ripples out from our lives into other people's lives, or how other people will come to know the gospel through us. And to do that, we're going to go back to a passage that I mentioned briefly at the end of our Easter Sunday service. It was a passage about the triumph of Jesus Christ, uh, but in the middle of that passage is this powerful motivator to be spreading the gospel of Jesus. So we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verse 12 to 17. And it says this, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us, spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So this passage starts by speaking about the gospel being proclaimed, and it ends by talking about the gospel being proclaimed. But in the middle is this powerful image, this powerful motivator uh, for us to be doing this. And the picture that's being created here is that of a, a Roman triumphal procession. Uh, so it's kind of something like, I suppose, a victory parade. So Rome, as it was out sort of conquering the world, and as it won battles, it would, it would be these parades coming through the city of, of Rome, these elaborate ceremonies where there would be like dancers and singers and incense bearers and paintings depicting the whole, the whole battle. And it was all just there to parade the magnificence of the Roman Empire and the general who had won this, this battle. And there was always a, a certain uh, amount of elements in this procession. So at the front of the procession would be a depiction of their gods who they thought had given them the victory. And behind that would come the Roman general who had won the battle. He'd be in a chariot drawn by four horses. And then behind him would be these sets of people. So, so first would be uh, the, the slaves um, that were now being captured from whatever country that, that they had conquered. And then behind them would be some of the Roman citizens uh, from who were living in that country that had now been liberated. So for example, we know uh, that when Titus Flaminius liberated Greece, that a thousand Roman citizens living in Greece were now free, and they were part of this parade. So the first part would have been these Greeks that were paraded as now enslaved, and behind them, the Romans who were enslaved, who are now free. And between these two sets of people would be these incense bearers. 
And we don't know exactly why they had incense bearers in the parade, except for maybe that Rome really did smell really bad. Uh, and that's kind of how these parades, we have over 300 different pictures and inscriptions of how these parades, that's what Paul's using as a metaphor, this Roman triumphal procession. And how does that connect with this gospel picture? Well, I think some of it's obvious and some of it's not so obvious. So at the front, the depiction of the gods who had won the battle, well, Paul is using that to say God is the God that has won the battle in Christ. So Christ is the general. That's why it says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always gives us the victory. So it's kind of that picture of God and then Jesus Christ, the general who has won the battle and then there's the, the two sets of people. So obviously the first group are those that have been liberated by Jesus Christ and what he has done. And then will be the other set of people who, who are not yet liberated and who are still captives. And then there are the incense bearers. And Paul's point is we are the incense bearers. Bearers. That, listen to verse 14 and 15 again. It says, Through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. We're the ones that spread the fragrance. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. We're the incense bearers. So the question is, what does it mean for us to be the fragrance of his knowledge, the aroma of Christ. It's such an interesting metaphor. Uh, I suppose if we had to ask, like take a quick poll on what the most important senses are. You know, if you had to think about, okay, uh, so if you had to lose one of your senses, uh, what would you lose? Like sight, you know, hearing, touch, taste, or smell? I suppose most people would say smell. It just doesn't seem that important, does it? And yet if you think about it, I mean, smell is such a, it's so powerful. I don't know about you, but like for me, when I'm smelling things, sometimes there's powerful memories that come back for certain smells. So whenever I walk, you know, go past like a diesel engine and you smell those diesel fumes, it's like I immediately think of the tractor on the little plot farm that, that I grew up on. And, and smells used it like as, as a warning. I mean, you think about, you know, smelling smoke and wondering, hey, like, you know, what's going on here? It alerts you to danger. Now, what does it mean for us to be the fragrance or the aroma or the smell of Christ? Well, I think it's three things. So two of them are related to the use of the word aroma, and the other is related to this very interesting metaphor of the incense bearers in the Roman triumphal procession. So the first, what does it mean to be an aroma or fragrant offering? And the first is, well, it means accepting suffering and faithfully and with great perseverance enduring suffering and even sacrificing ourselves for the good of others. Now we see this in, there's only three uses of this word aroma in the New Testament. So here in 2 Corinthians is one. Then Ephesians chapter five, verse two, it says this, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So one of the ways, Paul must have this in mind, one of the ways that we become this fragrant offering, this aroma of Christ, is to, like Christ, be willing to endure suffering with great faithfulness, with hope in front of us, and even willing to sacrifice ourselves for others. And I know he's thinking this because the context of this passage is just really interesting. So we read how Paul's in a place called Troas, and he writes about there's this marvelous opportunity for the gospel. Now, he's the great evangelist church planner. He was expecting him to go and just exploit that and evangelize this place of Troas. He says, a door of opportunity is open to me. But then we read that, but he didn't find Titus there. So he comes to Troas. There's no Titus, his friend, and we read that he's Spirit was not at rest, so he left. 
And you think about that in the context of this discussion about faithfully declaring and demonstrating and witnessing the gospel, it rippling out. You think, well, that seems kind of like a missed opportunity. It seems a little bit like, like failure. So what was happening here? So Paul planted the church at Corinth. He spent 18 months in Corinth planting this church. And he moved on from there to Ephesus. And while he was at Ephesus, he heard news that just stuff was not going down well in Corinth. Like the church was in all sorts of chaos. And so he addresses it by writing them a letter, which is a letter we have, 1 Corinthians. And he sends that letter with Timothy. So Timothy goes to Corinth with this letter, and he tries to just deal with all that's happening in the church. But things did not go so well. The church at Corinth fought Timothy, rejected him, kind of pushed back at everything that Paul had said. So word gets back to Paul at Ephesus that this church is just like imploding and they've rejected Timothy and rejected his letter. And so Paul makes an urgent visit to Corinth. He's going to come in person and he's going to sort stuff out. And he does that except... It does not go so well. Like it's just this uprising against Paul, criticism of him and his leadership and these other figures that are pushing him out. And he leaves Corinth and he comes back to Asia just really dejected and discouraged and humiliated. So then Paul writes another letter to this church at Corinth. So he's down, he's you know, probably a little bit angry, and he writes another letter that he sends with Titus. To Corinth, And as soon as he sends that letter, he must have had that moment that I'm sure you, we've all had that. Like you, there's a difficult situation, you fire off that email, and the moment you click send, you're like, oh my gosh, like what did I just do, you know? Uh, you, you just wonder about, man, that was probably a little bit. And so he's very anxious about that letter. Now, we don't have a record of that, of that letter uh, that he sent. And so he's sitting now. He's desperate to find out. He sent this letter with Titus. He's, he's, he's regretting this letter that he sent, and he's just desperate to find out what's happening in that church. So he wants to see Titus. He had made this arrangement to meet him at Troas. So he comes to Troas, in desperate to hear what's happened, and Titus is not there. On top of that, we know from 2 Corinthians, the letter he's now writing in that situation, that he was under such physical affliction that he sums it up in 2 Corinthians saying he despaired of life itself. But that's like, it's not biblical language. That's like depression. Despairing of life itself. Like wishing he was dead. It was how bad. He was so emotionally low. So physically conflicted at this time. And it's in this context that he writes these words. So, so listen again. So when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, even though a door was open to me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. He's just so preoccupied, so worried. He's like, I can't do this. So I took leave. I left. And I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of him everywhere. So what does that mean to you? Like in this, you put yourself in that situation. What does that mean to you? I mean, to me, it means just like a whole bunch of things. I mean, firstly, it means, hey, this idea of triumph that we spoke about on Easter Sunday, it's not triumphalism. It's not this idea that you become a Christian and Christ is our general and has won the battle and that all of a sudden everything's going to go well and there's never going to be trouble. There's a difference between triumphalism and living in the triumph of Christ. And we see that here. Paul's in this immensely difficult situation, despairing of life itself. Right? It's not triumphalistic, but he's still reflecting on the triumph of Christ. Secondly, it's just so interesting to me that in this context, I, I was sent to proclaim the gospel, and then I was just, I couldn't do it, and I was so confident, I, just, I left. It's so interesting to me just how open he is about this. This is this frank discussion of the difficulty that he's going through. He's not pretending, he's vulnerable, and he's, he doesn't make any apologies. Like, I'm really sorry, I'll, I'll make a turn by Troas again another day when I'm feeling better. 
Like, there's no embarrassment. There's no apology. He's just openly speaking about what he's going through. And you must be feeling like this. I know it. I know that I do. Like sometimes the world is just suffocating around you. You're holding on to your faith, never mind evangelizing and speaking your faith, which I think leads to the next interesting bit. Perhaps one of the reasons he could just leave it and go is because he knew that this idea of demonstrating and declaring the gospel, of it rippling out of your life, is not restricted to a time and a place. It's a lifestyle. It's just so interesting. He says, he through us spreads the fragrance of him everywhere, kind of wherever I'm going next. He went on to Macedonia, like God's just the way we live. It's not restricted to a particular time and place. He's going to do this everywhere. And lastly, this is the clincher, as it turns out, you just listen here, as it turns out, faithfully, Enduring suffering, just sticking it out and persevering with this hope and this triumph in the back of your mind and clinging it out, just faithfully enduring suffering is an aroma of Christ. Just doing that is giving off this fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus, who himself would, would sit in the Garden of Gethsemane and be faced with this turmoil, and like, I wish you could take this away from me, but not my will, but yours, and just enduring it despite difficulty. Right? That is, that's connecting with the story of Jesus, with the death of Jesus. I mean, listen, a witness to the gospel, a credible, winsome witness to the gospel is not... I came to Jesus and all my troubles went away. This is the opposite. A credible, winsome testimony to the gospel is the ability to hold on in faith with hope, knowing the reality of the triumph of Jesus and just holding on is an aroma. That's Ephesians 5 verse 2. That is the aroma of Christ rippling out as we just hold on, which is what we're doing right now, isn't it? It's like all of us in church, it, we're holding on. You may not feel like evangelism is like what's in your mind, although I think we have wonderful opportunities for that. So I miss that. But part of just faithfully enduring with hope is the aroma of Christ. So that's the first, sacrifice. Number two, supply. So this one's going to come at like... From a tangent. The other, so 2 Corinthians, the word aroma comes up. Ephesians 5, the word aroma comes up. And then Philippians 4, the only other time it comes up. Verse 8 says this. Paul says, I've received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So Paul is literally talking about receiving financial aid from these guys, and he calls it a fragrant offering. It's the exact same word, this aroma of Christ. This is just, it's so different to point number one, which was sacrifice. And now we're talking about literally giving to the needs of ministry. And it seems like it's coming from left field. But I mean, Second Corinthians is so much in the same letter that he writes about a ministry of giving. Chapter eight and chapter nine are some of the most powerful motivators that we have in the Bible for this kind of ministry of giving. And I don't want to labor this point now because this not exactly the right time to be talking about, you know, giving to a church, but let's not miss this just because it's awkward. And to be honest with you, as a church, we're already feeling the effects of the downturn in the economy, and we're already having to have these difficult conversations about what that means for us. And for a lot, of maybe a few of you who have not been so affected, this is a time where this ministry of supply and perhaps it even is a sacrifice as well at this time, is a fragrant offering acceptable and pleasing to God. 
not only for your own act of worship, but as supply to a ministry which can then be, we hope, a fragrant offering rippling out through the city of Johannesburg. So that's two ways so far what it means to be an aroma, to, su to suffer and sacrifice for others, to supply needs of ministry. And then third is to be a blessed subversion. I really just try to squeeze in three S's there. Right? So blessed subversion, let me explain what that means. But it comes from the central idea of the incense bearers in the triumphal procession who are dividing, on the one hand, those who are perishing from death to death, Paul says, and those who are going from life to life. It's just such an interesting picture. What does that mean to be standing between these people who have been liberated and these people who are captives? I think on a simple level, it, just, it means that for some, the gospel message, that they will reject it. And some will hear it. I think it's sort of what it means on a simple level. But on a deeper level, on a profound level, I think it's such an accurate picture of how Christians should be viewed. It's a great picture of what the world would think of us if we are truly living the way that we should be living. And let me explain that by just asking this question around incense, right? So who of you like the smell of incense? Like if you were here, we'd have hands raising. I don't know how many hands we'd raise. So I, I mean, I can't stand it, right? But generally, the kinds of shops where there's incense burning, or, but there's other really cool stuff that I want to go buy, like coffee and spices and things. So I'll just like hold my breath and just, and just go in. So I, I don't like incense. A lot of people love incense, right? You either love it or you hate it. It's, it's like a mix, I think that's exactly how the world kind of should look at Christians. They're not really sure. Like, do we love these guys? Do we hate them? Well, a bit of both, really. And here's what I mean. Because on the one hand, as Christians, if we're, if we're living as we should be living, in other words, the world looks on us in this time of coronavirus and goes, man, these guys, like how are they holding on with such hope with such peace, it's like not this naive you know, idea, but it, it, they're looking on and, and they're wondering about that. They see us persevering or, or they see us sacrificing for the good of others, even at times like this, or to connect with what I spoke about you know, last week, a couple of weeks ago, that they see our zealousness for good works, how they know, they see how we are for them as a church. We are for you, for their well-being. Like ultimately, we're just such a blessing to the city. We're just such blessing to our neighbors, to our family members. It's just like they look at us and go looking at that element and go, man, we love these guys. But on the other hand, we are also being deeply transformed. We're just very aware of sin in our lives. And so we're denouncing sin. We're putting it off as we've spoken about in the series. And so we're living very differently to the way the world is. We're making different choices to the choices that they're making. And to be honest, that just brings about conflict because uh, they feel perhaps judged by that. It just makes things awkward and there's sort of a, a tension there. Um, and on top of that, I mean, we actually do make stands. We speak out against injustices and against things that sometimes is very confrontational. So on the, on the one hand, they like love us for the good that we do, and the, on the other hand, despise us because we radically are committed to Jesus. And so they look at us and like, man, like, do we love these guys? Do we hate these guys? Or both? Exactly. Exactly. That's how we should be living. This, the, the ripple effects of the gospel in our lives should lead to this idea of we're in between and there's life and then there's death and people are looking at We can't make out how these guys stand in that situation because we're so zealous for good works and blessing and sacrificing and serving and loving and hoping to see people's well-being achieved. But on the other hand, we know that through the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're radically committed to him and radically following him and radically obeying him and radically being transformed and that brings conflict. 
And like incense people just don't. Do we love it? Do we hate it? We just, we don't know. Some people should see us. If the death of Jesus has truly, truly taken hold of our lives. Guys, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you, and I'm just, I'm so sure that in the hundreds of homes around the city where we're gathered, that there's various forms of suffering. For some, immense suffering of feeling overwhelmed, uncertain, in deep emotional pain, and a physical distress. Maybe due to reduced finance or loss of job or health effects, victims of the virus. People in situations not unlike that which Paul was in. And God, I pray, as we remind ourselves again of your triumph, Lord Jesus, if that would produce in us this ability to suffer well, not naively pretending that everything's fine, that able to be vulnerable and open and unembarrassed and share the realities of what we're going through, but at the same time be able to say, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. God, I pray as we close out this series, Lord Jesus, that your death and your resurrection, it would ripple, the ripple effects, the consequences. would create a resonance within us and that we would resonate with that and that there would be resonating ripple effects out of us into the world around us. That other people could have a sense of this hope, a sense of this peace. Help us, Jesus, to suffer. And God, just pray for all the families under deep turmoil and, and stress. Deliver us. But we pray, God, our ultimate hope is to not come out of this season of difficulty just having made it out, but having been transformed with a deep faith and a close connection and relationship with you, Lord Jesus, that as we identify with you in this time of suffering, God, use this time. Don't just deliver us, transform us through it by helping us to suffer with faith and hope and with great perseverance. For those that feel like they're at the end, give them just strength for one more day and one more day and one more day. And God, I pray that you would help us to supply the needs of your ministry in whatever way that we can whether that be with words and opportunities and doors that are open to us, whether it be with time that we can offer, or whether that be with the the ability to give financially such a fragrant offering at this time in particular. God, would you spur up in us radical generosity that the world would notice us by extreme generosity in a time of, of scarcity. What a testimony that would be to you. Help us as a church and as individuals to be that. And God, we pray, just as we close out this series, <laughs> this picture, this image of incense bearers, and light and darkness and sw- swirling around, may we be compelled, so convicted from the innermost places to live radically as your followers, Lord Jesus in a way that, to be sure, brings confrontation and difficulty and in the same way as we prayed a few weeks ago. That you would compel us to be zealous for good works, to love others radically, to be such a blessing to them. Help us be that as individuals and as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.